Hey guys, my name is Brad. I'm the lead pastor here at New Life Church, and I want to welcome you to our online teachings. One of our core convictions as a church is that everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. Now, I know that for some of us, coming into a church building might be intimidating, it might be scary, and I get that. But I want you to know that there is always a place for you here at New Life and that you were made for real in-person community. We meet on Sundays in downtown Wayland. You can check out our website for more information on service times. But for now, I hope God speaks powerfully to you through his word. Love you guys. So we're going to continue our series uh, this morning, Summer in the Psalms. And uh, one of the hobbies that I've gotten really into recently is rock climbing. And when I say I've gotten really into rock climbing, what I really mean is I've gotten into watching Netflix documentaries about rock climbing. (laughs) One of the most famous rock climbers uh, in the entire world is a guy named Tommy Caldwell. Tommy Caldwell is super, super well known for, um, for climbing and scaling uh, this rock right here, El Capitan. El Capitan is a 3,000-foot, uh, oh man, my hands are sweaty just looking at that, 3,000-foot tall slab of granite in Yosemite National Park out in California. And what Tommy's really well known for is climbing routes that nobody has ever climbed in their life before. And so here you see him climbing what's called the Dawn Wall. And this is the very first time anybody has ever scaled this wall. He's working through what's called Pitch 15 right now, which is the hardest section of this wall. If you notice, there is barely a place for him to find footing, for him to put his feet. If you Notice there is barely a place for him to grab onto. And what you'll see in a moment, if you look carefully, is he's actually missing his index finger. He doesn't have an index finger, which is one of the most important parts for grabbing onto things and gripping things and holding things. This climb was six years in the making for Tommy meticulously, day by day, dreaming about this, mapping out every inch of this 3,000-foot granite wall. Tommy and his partner, Kevin Jorgensen, spent three weeks on this wall climbing this. Can you imagine? Like, you can see their tents down below there. Three weeks on the side of this wall, and not to mention, this is in January, so it's very cold It got so intense at one point that so many reporters, the entire world was watching Tommy. I believe this was 2015. I mean, you got the Today Show, you got ESPN, everybody's watching Tommy, and he got so sick of all these reporters calling him that he just tossed his phone off the side of the cliff. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? I love it. And the catalyst for Tommy even starting this climb was that his wife left him for another man. I mean, this guy knows better than probably anybody else feelings of disorientation, feelings of not knowing which way is up or which way is down, feelings of not knowing how to find his footing or get his bearings in a place where his limits are constantly being pushed and constantly being tested. Tommy Caldwell knows disorientation very, very well. And I'm guessing after this past year, you and I probably know disorientation very, very well as well. Disorientation is that feeling where you can't quite get your bearings, where you can't quite find your footing. Disorientation is the feeling, that gut punch feeling when you get that piece of news that you had just lost that relationship or that job or that money, and you don't know which way is up, or which way is down, which way is right, or which way is left. Disorientation is when you have a schedule that is packed so incredibly full that even the thought of finding opportunities to rest or slow down feels like a distant pipe dream. That's disorientation. Disorientation is when a global pandemic, when you have a year where a global pandemic meets a very intense election, meets a racial reckoning, meets rioting, meets claims of election fraud, meets an insurrection. I mean, that is disorientation. We have had a year of disorientation. Am I right? And what I love about the Psalms is that there's a pattern in the Psalms of disorientation. 
There's a pattern in the Psalms where they get really, really honest and say things like, God, I can't find my footing right now. I have nothing to grab onto. I am falling. There's a theologian named Walter Brueggemann who who puts it like this. If you can put that quote up there, Keegan. He describes psalms of disorientation like this. These are the shrill speeches of those who suddenly discover that they are trapped and that the water is rising and the sun may not come up tomorrow in all its benevolence and we feel betrayed. These are the psalms of rivers flooding in monsoon season in Michigan right now. These are the psalms of waters rising where you cannot find your bearings and your footings. And these pattern, this pattern appears over and over again in the psalms. But here's the good news about the psalms. Don't miss this. This is the good news about the psalms. They don't leave us in a place of disorientation. The pattern of the psalms is that they provide us opportunities to find our footing once again. And the question I want to answer for us this morning is this one right here. How do we find our footing in a disoriented world? How do we find our footing when life falls apart? How do we find our footing when things get flipped on their head or when we can't figure out anything to grab onto? How do we find our footing once again? Because like I said earlier, we're in a crossroads right now as a church. We've walked through a year of disorientation and tumultuous times and seasons where everything's flipped on its head. And we have an opportunity right now to experience a reorientation or even a new orientation that we have not yet experienced before. This is the wrestling of the Psalms. And the Psalms provide a pathway to finding our footing once again. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, open with me to Psalm chapter 122. We're going towards the back of the book now. Psalm chapter 122. And I'm just going to read this whole psalm. It's only nine verses over us, and then we're going to dive into it as we look at what it means to find our footing once again. Psalm 122 verse 1 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There, thrones for judgment were set. The thrones of the house of David pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. How do we find our footing once again in a disoriented world? By gathering with the people of God for the worship of God. Let me say that again. We find our footing once again in a disoriented world by gathering with the people of God for the worship of God. You see, this particular psalm, it finds itself in a section of psalms, 15 of them called the Psalms or the Songs of Ascent. These are pilgrim songs. These are songs that Jewish people sang as they journeyed towards Jerusalem. You see, three times a year, God commanded his people from every tribe of Israel to descend, or I should say ascend, upon Jerusalem to worship him. It was the Feast of Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Passover reminded the Jewish people of God's redeeming work in their lives. And God said, I want my people to gather around my name to remember that stuff. Pentecost was a celebration of the law of God that was given to Moses. And so God said, I want my people to not just remember the physical redemption that I offered them, but the spiritual redemption that I give them. And so the command was God's people gathering together in Jerusalem to celebrate. And then finally, the Feast of Tabernacles was a celebration of God's provision, his physical harvest that he had provided. It was at the end of the harvest season where this feast was celebrated. And on the way to Jerusalem, these 15 psalms, the songs of ascent, were the soundtrack. They were the worship set of the Jewish people. Can you imagine this scene? Like, picture it for a moment. 
You have people from every walk of life, every tribe of Israel coming together to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the highest city in Israel. So it was an ascent from whatever town, whatever place you were coming from. It was an ascent. You were going up a hill, much like climbing a mountain. You have people coming from every tribe from Dan and Naphtali and Reuben and Manasseh and Judah and all of these different tribes coming together to worship, singing the same songs. You have people from different walks of life coming to gather together around the name of God. You have rich people. You have poor people coming together. You have shepherds and kings. You have fishermen and farmers. You have... um, You have all different sorts of people. You have young people. You have old people all coming together, singing these same songs together. You also have people in different seasons of life coming together. You have some who have experienced devastating loss. You have others living in a season of prosperity. Some with flooded basements and some with dry basements coming together to worship. You have people who are healthy. You have people who are sick all coming together, singing these songs of ascent. And these songs of ascent serve one purpose. It's all about the family of God reorienting their lives around the worship of God. They're about the family of God reorienting their lives around the worship of God. When I read the songs of ascent, I can't help but get a picture of what the church is called to be right here and right now. That if I were to define the church, I would say this is a pretty good starting definition for the church. That we are the family of God who gather to reorient our lives around the worship of God. That's why we gather. We have one reason for gathering, to see God's glory at work among us, to lift his name high, to gather around the person of Jesus. To be honest, I think the the church, the church is called to be this type of pilgrim community that we are on a journey together. We are on a pilgrimage And we are a community that is, in many ways, like Tommy, climbing the rock. We are ascending. We are, our goal, our desire is to see the rule and reign of Jesus here on earth as it is in heaven. And much like the Jewish people, we are also on an ascent. We are also on a journey together. It's not a solo journey. Don't miss this. There's no such thing as a solo Lone Ranger Christian in scripture. You will not find it. It is a communal journey where people from different walks of life, dare I say different political views, (laughs) different values, different perspectives, different jobs, different income levels can come together and surround the person of Jesus and lift his name up high above all other names. You see, when I look at our world, I think one of the biggest disorientations that we are living in right now is the lie that so many of us are bombarded with. Every single one of us is bombarded with us every single day. And the lie is this, that it's all about me. (laughs) It's all about me. And so when you have a culture that is saying it's all about you and you are worshiping a God who's saying, no, it's actually not all about you, it's about me, the end result is inevitably disorientation, not knowing where to find our footing. One of the things that I've noticed lately is, and maybe you've noticed this, and if you haven't, you will from here on out, is when you scroll through social media, it is just narcissism all around. I believe that is the biggest sin of our culture right now, is just utter narcissism. That it's all about me. That everybody else is toxic. (laughs) That I am the standard. And other people need to measure up. In fact, I started following this account the other day on Instagram. And I love this account because it's, it's super, super inspiring to me. And I just want to share some of the memes, hoping that they'll inspire you too. Here's the, here's the first one. Hold others to an impossibly high standard, but love yourself exactly as you are. <laughs> Next one. Avoid narcissists who focus on themselves. All of the energy and attention in the world should be focused on you. And then the last one here. What today's society needs is more people who are completely infatuated with themselves. (laughs) Social media 
has convinced us that it is all about me. And I'm here to tell you that in the church of Jesus Christ, it is not all about you. That's a hard pill for some of us to swallow. It is not. We don't gather so that we can be inspired or have an emotional response to a worship song or shed a tear during a sermon. We gather to remind ourselves that there is a center of this universe and he is not me. And he is not you. We gather because it's in our gatherings that we can actually see God's power displayed in each other's lives in ways that we can't see in other places. We gather to practice and exercise gifts so that I can see how God is moving through you and you can see how God is moving through me and we can see how God is using us to reach young people and old people alike. That is why we gather. We gather to lift up the name of Jesus. And so I think a hard question to ask this morning is what does it look like when narcissism creeps into the family of God? What does it look like when it's an all about me mentality that creeps into the family of God. Well, I think there's a couple things that it can look like. I'm not saying this is the case for everybody, but it can look like this sometimes. Number one is it can look like sibling rivalry in the family. Comparison. Jealousy. Why do they seem to have their act together while my basement is utterly flooded right now? I keep too soon for that probably because it's still raining. Um, <laughs> But it can look like comparison and jealousy and kind of this toxic, like, one-upping each other. Instead of sacrificial service of each other, it can, it can look like a race to the bottom of comparison. Another one, it can look like bystander effect. I'm not going to do it because somebody else will. Guys, there's nobody else coming. It's us. <laughs> God doesn't have a plan B for this world. It's his church. I'm not going to serve because I just need to be fed right now. That's what narcissism can look like. I'm not saying it always does, but it can look like that. It can also look like isolation. That I'm just going to sit at home and consume and turn off a service if it doesn't inspire me or I don't like it. One of the things that I've learned during COVID is that absence doesn't make the heart grow fonder. I think it actually does the opposite. I think absence often can make the heart grow bitter. And I've seen that happen in the church. And then I'll go last here. What does it look like when narcissism creeps into church leadership? Well, it can look like a pastor who puts their entire identity in the success or failure of a church. It can look like taking credit for successes and bearing the weight of failures in a way that your entire identity is wrapped up in it. And can I be honest with you? That's a struggle I've had. I love this community. But my wife and I have had to have conversations about what it looks like for my entire identity not to be wrapped up in this community. And we're still learning that in that area. Like, if I can go first and stay from stage here, that, like, we don't gather to watch a show on a stage. We gather to lift up the name of Jesus. He is the center of our worship gatherings. Sometimes I don't even like the setup of like church where there's a stage and lights and a worship band and things like that. It's how we do it. It's what we have now. But I want us to keep that in mind, that there is a center of our gatherings, and it's not the person on stage, and it's not the people leading in worship, and it's not you sitting in seats or watching online. There is a center of our gatherings, and his name is Jesus. And this is what the songs of ascent can remind us of. That as you read about these people from, Jeru uh, from Israel converging upon Jerusalem to worship the name of Jesus, it is this reminder over and over again that we are called as the family of God to reorient our lives around the worship of God. And if you were to read through these Psalms of Ascent, which are Psalm 120 through 134, you see this attitude of communal worship, this theme come up time and time again. It's a beautiful thing about what can happen when the people of God gather together around the worship of God. And so I just want to give you a highlight reel of some of these Psalms and what they speak to. The first one here is the one we read today, Psalm 122, 9. For the sake of the house of our God, I will seek who's good? Your good. I'll serve you sacrificially for the sake of this house. I'll serve you without expectation for the sake of this house, for your sake. Because when I do that, 
we see the power of God at work in our lives. Let's go on to the next one here. Chapter 124, verse 8. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. Guys, the worship gathering is where we find our footing once again. It is where we are reminded that there is a rock upon which we stand, that as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds who? His people. There is a footing that is found when the people of God come together to worship God. Next one here, chapter 126, verse 2. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. In this gathering, there are opportunities to worship, to praise, to laugh, to have fun, to rejoice. And guess who notices? People who are not yet here when that happens. The nations notice when Jerusalem gathers together and rejoices and expresses gratitude of what God has done. Next one here in chapter 128, verse 1 and 2. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. There is blessing found in the gathering of God's people. There is an awe and a reverence, and an acknowledgement that God is holy. And that the very fact that we have an opportunity to gather together and see his holiness on display, man, that is his grace at work in our lives. Awe and wonder and reverence is cultivated in our gatherings. And then the last one here in chapter 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers or other translations say, when God's people dwell in unity. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Are we seeing the theme that is coming up in these songs of ascent, these worship songs, that they are individual, but then they are communal, that God is bringing together his family for the purpose of his glory. And I will tell you, every single one of these is cheapened and weakened when we try to ascend the mountain by ourselves. Every single one of them that you shortcut God's work and his glory made known in your life when you try to ascend the mountain by yourself. The reality is we're kind of stuck with each other (laughs) for a very long time. I read a post yesterday that said like 200 billion years in heaven is just the beginning. We're kind of stuck with each other for a while. We're part of a family and we're a little bit of a dysfunctional family sometimes, which is cool. Like that's, that's good. But we gather for worship and we humbly serve each other and we raise our kids in the church and we give sacrificially and we serve in our community and we do the work of the gospel globally all to remind ourselves that there is a person at the center of this story and he is not me and he is not you. Church is the family of God reorienting our lives around the worship of God There's an author named Philip Yancey who, when looking at the entire Bible, summed it up in this way, that God gets his family back. God gets his family back. That the story of scripture is God redeeming families, God redeeming individuals, God redeeming communities together. And so the question is not, am I going to participate in God's family? The question, if you read this book faithfully, is how am I going to participate in God's family? It's not if, it's how. I love Jesus, but I don't love the church is not an option if you take Jesus at his word. The church has her flaws. (laughs) There are issues in the church. I will be the first to admit that and the first to acknowledge that, but this family is worth fighting for. This community is worth fighting for, so much so that a global pandemic will not rip it apart. And so let's move into the New Testament here. There are two kind of broad concepts that the New Testament uses, two broad words that the New Testament uses to describe the community of the church. They're not always translated from the Greek word into the English as church, but I want you to just take a look, and and I think this will really give you a good sense of what it means to be the church. The first one is ekklesia. Ecclesia is used over 118 times in the New Testament. And you know what the word ekklesia means? 
Literally, it means called out. As in, in a public setting, called out of your homes into a public space. It was used in Greco-Roman culture to talk about public decrees. It is the calling out from homes into public spaces. When it comes to the church, you are called out of this world and called to the person of Jesus. To be the church means to be called out. (laughs) To be called out of our comfort zones to be called out of unhealthy rhythms and patterns in our lives that may be actually leading us towards destruction and not towards life, to be called out for the sake of something bigger and better than ourselves, to be called out for the worship of God. It's a beautiful thing. That's ecclesia. And then the second concept here, and I love this one, and when these two things are taken in tandem with each other, beautiful things happen. The second one is koinonia. And what koinonia means is essentially the agape love of God expressed in the community. It's often directly translated into English as fellowship. It's this idea that I humbly serve you. That when church is working, that we are called to humbly serve each other, that I give for your benefit, for your sake, for your good. It is fellowship, it is participation, it is community. You've probably heard the statement all the time, the church is not a building. The church is not a building, but it is a gathering. The church is not a building, but it is a gathering. I think God knew that we would be prone to disorientation. I think he he knew that in this life, we, we, we would be prone to forgetfulness. We would be prone to drift. We would be prone to lose our footing all the time. I think he knew that we would be prone to take credit for our own successes and bear the weight of our own failures. I think God knew the heaviness of this life. I think he knew that we would often overlook his presence, his provision, that we would get discouraged, lonely, distracted. I think he knew that if we didn't, he didn't give us a mandate to go into the world, we might actually become bitter at the world. And so he gave us each other. He gave us each other. Church isn't an event you attend once a week or once a month. It's an active participation in the family of God. Church is pulling the concept of God's family off the pages of this book and into real lived life expression. Church is life on life community. That's church. As we uh, close this morning, I want to go back to the story of Tommy on the side of the mountain here. So this is, once again, another picture to make your hands sweat. (laughs) So Tommy, after days and days and days of climbing this pitch, this pitch 15 where there is nothing to grab onto, he finally makes it through it. And it's in this moment of outrageous joy, outrageous kind of gladness, where he can see the end of his climb in sight. The hardest part of the climb is behind him. He still has 1,500 feet more up to go, but the hardest part is behind him. He knows from this point on he can do it. He has accomplished it. If you're Tommy in this moment, think about this. Six years of your hard work about ready to come to fruition the entire world watching about ready to sing your praise and exclaim your greatness for climbing this mountain. Heck, he could even stick it to his ex-wife and rub it in a little bit. Like, this is a really good moment for Tommy as he is ready to ascend and make his final ascent up this mountain. He is ready to be literally on top of the world. There's just one big problem. His climbing partner, Kevin, has not yet made it through pitch 15. His climbing partner, Kevin, is still falling every single time he attempts this specific part. And so Tommy here is faced with a choice. He can go up the mountain and take the glory for himself, or he can go back for his partner and they can climb the mountain together. What would you do in that moment? What Tommy did is he went back. He went back for his partner. He said, we're going to climb this thing together. I'm not going to do it on my own. All of the praise and all of the glory in the world is not worth doing this thing on my own. 
And so he goes back. And, and I'll never forget the moment that I saw these two men hit the summit together. Here is a picture of it right here. They have made it. I'm like weeping like a little child as I'm watching this documentary. It's this beautiful picture of teamwork. But the reason that I think it impacted me so much is because this is exactly what the church is called to be. That we don't leave each other behind. That we don't climb this thing on our own. That we actually are climbing in partnership with one another. That this journey of faith is hard work. That it is not for the faint of heart, but we do it together. We do it in community. You guys, the church flourishes when we understand this. The church flourishes when we show up from week to week with expectancy about not what God is going to do in me only, but about what God is going to do in each of us. Like when you show up with expectancy to this place about what God is going to do in the person sitting next to you, that's when we start to grasp what church is. Church flourishes when we recognize that God doesn't give us talents and gifts and abilities to make our own name great. No offense, but he didn't give you talents to make yourself famous. He gave us talents and gifts and abilities to build up his body. Go read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 if you want to challenge me on that. That's why he gave us spiritual gifts, to build up his body. The church flourishes when we, when we recognize that. The church flourishes when we recognize that God's solution to a disoriented world, the way that God helps us find our footing again is when we worship him together with each other. So are you, are you out of balance right now? Are you struggling to find your footing? My question for you is, how are you actively participating in this family? I'm not going to pretend like it's a formula that easily fixes everything, but it is a path forward. The question I want to leave you with today is, how will you participate in this family this coming year? Maybe for some of us that's committing to serving our kids and our students. Maybe for some of us that's committing to just start praying for this community regularly, faithfully, daily. Maybe for some of us that's reaching out during a really hard season and saying, hey, I'm, I got my hands up. I'm, I'm drowning right now. I need some help. I need, I need some community. I need some support. Maybe for some of us that's, that's committing to being a part of or leading a small group in the fall. COVID has <laughs> done a number on small groups. We all know that. That's going to be a big part of who we are going in the fall, and I'm hoping a pandemic doesn't disrupt that again. <laughs> I don't know what it is for you, but how will you actively participate in this family? Because once again, I want you to hear it. Church is the family of God who chooses to reorient our lives around his worship, his glory, his praise. And so will you commit to doing that this coming year? Let me pray for us, and then we're going to respond in worship. Jesus, I thank you that you are good. You are worthy of all of our worship and all of our praise. That Jesus, our salvation is not found in our ability to make it up the mountain. You've already, you've already come down the mountain on our behalf. But God, we know that this journey of faith, this, this journey to become like you is not for the faint of heart. That it takes sacrifice. And it takes hard work. And it takes each other. And so, God, where there are grievances, where there is maybe bitterness that is lingering, God, may we not, may we not leave our climbing partners behind. May we go to them and pursue reconciliation. May we approach community from a place of not what can I get or what can I consume, but God, what can I contribute? How can I pour into the life of somebody else? God, how can I see you move in the life of my neighbor or my friend or the person I have not yet met? God, how can I see you move? God, when we get that, we get what it means to be your church. 
And so God, we thank you that your spirit is with us every step of the way. That you are here. That you are guiding our steps. And that you are walking with us. God, it's in the holy and matchless and precious name of Jesus that we pray. And everybody said, amen.